Greetings, everyone. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm Washington editor at large of the Atlantic, and we're here to in the in the fascinating and historic Pierre Hotel. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, the authors in just a moment of a great uh, new book out, Back Channel to Cuba: The Hidden History of Negotiations Between Washington and Havana, written by William Leo Grand uh, and Peter Cornblue. Uh, Bill Leo Grand is a professor of government at American University, and Peter Cornblue uh, directs the Cuba Documentation Project at the National Security Archive in Washington, D.C. And, and I, uh, will, I will do that. I'm going to show around. There's all sorts of extra collateral here. Uh, we have, is this just, uh, just Wednesday, October 1st? We have this great article in uh, the New York Times today uh, referencing the book and the research that Peter and Bill have done uh, on Kissinger drawing up plans to attack Cuba when, in fact, uh, uh, Fidel Castro had decided to take some action supporting rebels in Angola while s secretly Kissinger had been trying to normalize relations with Cuba. Met one of the many fascinating and incredible vignettes across a number of presidential administrations starting with Ford to try to take U.S.-Cuba relations in, in different places. Peter Cornblue has been, uh, why don't you hand me that as well, yeah. <clears throat> since I've been asked to do it. Yep. Uh, as well there is a, uh, a new article in The Nation uh, that contemporizes a lot of the lessons that have, that have emerged from the various encounters that presidential administrations have had with Cuba. This is just Brand of the Nations, titled Obama's Last Chance on Cuba uh, by Bill William Leo Brand and Peter Cornblue. Let me just say for a moment how I got into this. So I'm at the, uh, the, uh, the Atlantic. I've always been interested in the fact that despite Nixon going to China, despite opening up to Vietnam, which John McCain and John Kerry uh, opened up on, that uh, uh, when it came to Cuba, Cuba has always sort of been in a different gravitational force field uh, and, and dealt with differently. That the notion of liberalizing or open, opening up uh, economic activity or uh, uh, internet activity and whatnot might not have had the same uh, potential impacts that, on, that were clearly uh, the case in Vietnam and, and, uh, and in China. This man over here, and Bill, but, but Peter Cornblue, is just a tenacious guy in getting into secret stuff. Uh, and, and you know, going after people like Henry Kissinger and uh, another f uh, a late friend of mine, Bill Rogers, who used to attend New America Foundation events, was both friend and foe of Peter, uh, dogged him at meetings I would host and would come in, and Bill Rogers would be in there uh, trying to uh, establish his set of the record, and then Peter would hold up archive documents that had been declassified. And so he's sort of a declassification machine. Uh, and much of this here I attended uh, years ago a project with many of the people who had been involved in these secret efforts to uh, open up relations with Cuba. One of them was Henry Mankiewicz, uh, whom I knew uh, as the uh, former chairman of Hill and Knowlton. But I, I didn't know Mank Mankiewicz's government service. And Mankiewicz, who was a big Democrat, was a guy Henry Kissinger reached out to. And there are uh, transcripts of their original phone call. Uh, and so I had the pleasure of playing the role of Kissinger uh, in a reenactment with the real Henry Mankiewicz, who was the guy you know, who had done this you know, 40 years before. So, uh, and I think on NPR this morning, you also had another section, uh, in fact, where Larry Eagleburger, uh, it was Eagleburger and Bill Rogers, who were the two envoys of Kissinger who met in the Pierre Hotel here, uh, and they did a reenactment of that call on NPR. So without further ado, please uh, welcome uh, Peter Cornblue, co-author of this book, who's going to share a little bit about here, and then we're going to invite Bill, Ro uh, Bill Leo Grand up to uh, share more about the book and then open up to all of you. So, Peter Cornblue. Let me just say that Steve Clemens does a terrific Henry Kissinger <laughs> imitation. <laughs> we have gathered in this uh, kind of odd place uh, to hold a press conference for a specific historic reason, and that is because three floors above us uh, uh, on July 9th, 1975, the very first secret talks to actually normalize relations with Cuba were held with two deputies of Henry Kissinger, William Rogers, as Steve has mentioned, and Lawrence Eagleburger, who was Kissinger's top deputy at the time, uh, and two Cuban uh, representatives of Fidel Castro, uh, a UN official uh, named Nestor Garcia, and uh, one of Fidel Castro's top lieutenants, Ramon Sanchez Perotti, who'd been given a special visa to fly in um, uh, for these talks. Uh, and they held their first three-hour session in room 727. Uh, the United States came prepared with, a, with, with an agenda, all the things that would have to be done, that they would do to lift the embargo. Um, they had hoped the Cubans would come also. 
uh, with their agenda, uh, saying all the things they would do uh, to uh, soften their position on the United States, um, address the issue of compensation of expropriated properties, uh, and a lot of other details. It was a, a, a three-hour uh, meeting, and as, when the, the clock started to tick at the end, um, the Cubans noticed that Larry Eagleburger was looking at his watch because he needed to catch the, you know, 5:30 shuttle, Eastern Airlines shuttle back to Washington. And of course, the Cubans were upset. They were just getting going uh, uh, in this uh, meeting after three full hours. But uh, if any of you knows the U.S. government, three hours is an eternity on the U.S. side, uh, and that just speaks to the different perspectives and experiences that both sides brought to this historic. Uh, meeting. The Kissinger uh, documents and in fact the actual memorandum of conversation which is verbatim taken uh, from the notes taken by the note taker at this uh, meeting. We wanted to rent room 727, the actual room, but it's now a private residence uh, and uh, we, can't, we couldn't, this is the best we could, closest we could come uh, to it. The, uh, the actual notes are in your uh, briefing packet, the actual uh, transcript, uh, memorandum of conversation of these four men meeting for three hours that gives you the, the flavor. Uh, these, this material is quoted uh, in our book. The fact that, the, that this meeting took place uh, is not brand new news. It's something that we uh, reported uh, some years ago when we first got uh, the uh, secret file of Kissinger's initiative with Cuba declassified. Um, but um, the actual kind of language and the back and forth is something that I think you will find compelling and interesting to use if you choose to cover this particular part of the story. The new part of the story that we have brought today, which is uh, in the Times, is of course what happened thereafter. As this uh, initiative, this promising initiative at Rapprochement took place, uh, there was a kind of a cascade of, of issues um, uh, that the United States found a found pr problematic. The Cubans hosted a, a solidarity meeting with uh, uh, the independence movement uh, people of Puerto Rico. Um, and Fidel Castro received a request from Augustin Neto in Angola uh, to send uh, support and troops to help him fend off CIA-supported guerrillas uh, who were vying for power uh, in Angola as it emerged into as an independent nation. And Castro did send troops, quietly advisors first, uh, and then uh, thousands in the fall of 1975. Um, and at one point, a reporter said to Henry Kissinger in late 1975, when are you going to bring us a Cuban cigar? Uh, and Kissinger responded, well, I was about to do that, but the Cubans have done some things now that have given us pause, including going into Angola. What's new about the story that we've now broken in this book is that Kissinger went into President Ford's Oval Office said we have to smash the Cubans. I'm in favor of humiliating them, clobbering them. That pipsqueak, Fidel Castro, who does he think he is, you know, uh, you know, challenging me in this strategic chess game with the Soviets uh, for influence in Africa. I think we're going to have to smash the Cubans, but we might have to wait until after the 1976 elections. And President Ford says, I agree. And Kissinger convened a very elite group of national security managers, including Donald Rumsfeld, who uh, in his first term as, uh, as Secretary of Defense, he basically said to the representative of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I need military options. They need to be forceful. We don't get any credit for half-assed measures. We're going to need to think about invasion or blockade. Uh, I need contingency plans for deterring Cuba if it decides to deploy its troops beyond the borders of Angola. And he brought this whole domino theory story about how eventually the Cubans might move against Namibia and then perhaps South Africa. And of course, the United States didn't want to be defending South Africa. That would have been the most horrible thing for the U.S. Uh, you know, position in the whole third world. So he wanted to figure out a way to, to stop the Cubans in their tracks. We uh, obtained for this book the declassification of the contingency plans that were drawn up. They are in your packet and, and the memorandum of conversation of Kissinger talking to the special, uh, uh, the Washington uh, Special Actions Group uh, to design these plans. Uh, and you can read them at your, at your leisure now. Um, they're quite compelling, quite striking, um, literally, figuratively, uh, in, in, in their content. Um, 
We have some other stories that we have uh, that we have uh, brought f uh, for you uh, that are in the book. I should just say before I turn the floor over to uh, William Leo Grand that the book is filled with a cast of who's who in secret uh, intermediaries, some of whom have never been identified uh, publicly uh, before, and they're going to be done so here for the first time. But the the cast of figures uh, starting in uh, of, 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 of intermediaries that were used because Cuba and the United States for political reasons the United States can't bring itself to talk to Cuba openly um, you know starting all the way back in the in the uh, early 60s uh, included a uh, pioneering female journalist for ABC News uh, it included uh, politicians like Governor Bill Richardson uh, it included a Nobel uh, laureate in literature, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. It included um, a former president of the United States, Jimmy Carter uh, himself. Um, and at the very end of your packet, you're going to see a document that's never been seen before in this country. Uh, it is reproduced in the book itself, and you have it at the back of your packet. It is a private message from former President Carter in August of 1994 to um, Fidel Castro about his role as an interlocutor between Cuba and the United States during the Clinton administration to end the Balsero crisis. There's a, another set of documents uh, about a, another very colorful intermediary. I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to William Leo Grant, uh, who will share that with you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, the other, the other uh, story, which is really brand new in the book, one of, one of several, but the one that we're, we're highlighting today and, and for which we have the supporting documents in, in the press packet, is the role of J. Paul Austin, who was the chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola Corporation and a close friend of President Carter. Uh, President Carter relied upon uh, Paul Austin to be a kind of informal emissary for him to a number of countries. But Cuba in particular, uh, Austin went three times to Cuba, uh, once in the summer of 1977 to see if he could uh, manage to get Coca-Cola back into Cuba. Um, then uh, President Carter asked him to carry a message, a letter actually, from the president to Fidel Castro at the time of Cuba's involvement in Ethiopia, uh, which was in February, January, February of 1978. And uh, when we had a chance to speak with President Carter about this, he explained that the logic of sending Paul Austin uh, to Cuba was to find out if Fidel Castro was continued to be interested in normalization with the United States or not. The president thought that perhaps Fidel had been forced into involvement in Ethiopia by his Soviet patrons, um, and the president was hopeful that Castro would respond that no, he really did want to continue with the normalization process. Um, and so Paul Austin went down uh, to deliver that message. Uh, he came back with a, a, a warm but non-committal letter from Fidel Castro uh, to the president. Both of those letters are in the press packet. Uh, you can take a look at them. Um, but that, that miss mission didn't produce anything because at that point the Cubans were more interested in, in continuing their support for their allies in Africa than they were in improving relations with the United States. Although I should say that throughout 1978 there were a whole series of secret talks between Cuba and the United States about trying to improve relations, um, all of which are, are chronicled in the book itself. Then during the uh, migration crisis of Marielle in 1980, the president once again called upon Paul Austin to go down, uh, deliver a message uh, to the Cubans to see if they would be willing to close down the port of Marielle in exchange for a promise that after the US elections of 1980, the United States would reopen a broad set of negotiations with Cuba towards normalizing relations. Um, and those were the instructions that Paul Austin had, and those instructions are reproduced in the press packet as well. But um, unbeknownst to President Carter, Mr. Austin had begun to suffer from the early effects of Alzheimer's disease. And he went to Cuba and proposed to the Cubans that the President, uh, President Carter wanted to meet face-to-face -face at a summit 
with Fidel Castro before the end of the year, um, and that the United States was prepared to lift the embargo against Cuba before broader negotiations even began. So he returned uh, and was debriefed by a senior State Department official, Peter Tarnoff, uh, who then wrote up a report for the president on what Mr. Austin had said in Cuba. And we, we have a copy of that report in the press packet. And when the president read it, he came to the passage about a summit and he underlined it and put a huge exclamation point in the margin. He was clearly shocked uh, at this and immediately sent Peter Tarnoff back to Cuba uh, within a couple of days to let the Cubans know that Peter Tarnoff's message was the real official message from the president and that Mr. Austin uh, had made proposals on his own initiative that the president had not approved. The Cubans seemed to understand this perfectly well, and the result of, of Peter Tarnoff's mission was, in fact, that the Cubans closed the port of Mariel um, and, and were prepared to engage President Carter and, and the United States in a broader set of negotiations towards normalization after the 1980 election. But in fact, of course, what happened was the President lost the 1980 election and so that opportunity uh, never never uh, appeared. Um, so we have all the supporting documents for, for the Austin missions in the, in the press packet, and they make for interesting reading. They're a lesson in, on the one hand, the, uh, the perils of using private envoys who really operate without a safety net, if you will. Um, but on the other hand, also, I think the recurrent use of private envoys suggests on the one hand how politically sensitive relations with Cuba are and how presidents uh, would prefer often to use a trusted inter private intermediary rather than go through the layers of bureaucracy uh, and the risk of uh, leaks to the press that happens when you use regular diplomatic channels. There's a great passage that we quote in the book which is actually from a Cuban document. Uh, it's a, a transcript of a meeting Fidel Castro had with the president of Angola in which he explains why he has sent a private message to George Shultz through Peggy Delaney, David Rockefeller's daughter, offering uh, Cuba's constructive support for negotiations in Southern Africa. And the president of Angola asks Fidel, well, why didn't you use regular diplomatic channels? And, he, and, and Castro says, well, you know, when I send something through the U.S. interest section, which is the U.S. diplomatic mission in Havana, months go by and before I hear anything back, and sometimes I never hear anything at all. And so cutting through that kind of bureaucratic red tape has obviously been an attraction for presidents, as we show in the book. Every single president has used private envoys of one sort or another in this diplomatic uh, minuet between Cuba and the United States. Thank you. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, let me, let me, Peter, let me uh, invite you up here just for a minute. Let me just ask get one, one question and then open up to everyone. Sure. The, the, the one question I have is, you know, Peter is, is so great. Allison, come on in. Allison Silver. Sorry. Thompson Reuters. Hi. Diva of op-ed punditry. Uh, uh, in any case, we have Peter and, and William. I, I'm interested in the, the question of the more recent presidents, so President Obama and, and George W. Bush. You crack open secrets that under law, uh, un, un, uh, until under the Bush administration, they began trying to reclassify things that, that had been declassified. But nonetheless, you, you went through a whole declassification process to look at the footprints of a variety of people uh, and trying to open up relations in one way or another with Cuba. Given what you've learned in the patterns, what, do you have any insights into the George W. Bush administration and the Obama administration? Because you had ups and downs, very sure. serious rises and falls in the temperature on Cuba in, in both of those. Well, why don't I talk about the Bush administration and then I'll turn it to, to Peter to talk about Obama. Um, George W. Bush probably did less in terms of negotiations with Cuba than, uh, than any other president. He was the least interested in improving the relationship. Uh, the one big diplomatic initiative during Florida the Bush probably had something to do with uh, Florida had a lot to do with that. Uh, that and his, his brother Jeb down there in Florida. Um, the one big diplomatic initiative during the Bush administration was actually President Carter's private trip to Cuba in 2002 when he went down in an effort to, in effect, try to rebuild some of the bridges that George W. Bush was burning down. 
Um, and yet, even during the Bush administration, there were some low-level efforts at cooperation. There continued to be good cooperation between the Cuban border guards and the U.S. <coughs> Coast Guard on narcotics interdiction, for example, in the Caribbean. There continued to be uh, exchanges between law enforcement officials um, on counterterrorism issues, and uh, in particular around the case of uh, Luis Posada Carriles, mm. uh, who was the who who uh, had, had had snuck into the United States, and and uh, he he was a Cuban a Cuban exile originally trained by the CIA who had become part of, of what were called then the autonomous groups of Cuban uh, exiles that engaged in terrorist attacks on Cuba. He was the intellectual author of the uh, bombing of a Cuban civilian airliner in 1976 that killed 73 uh, Cuban and Guyanese civilians. Um, and, and also then the author of a series of hotel bombings, of bombings of tourist hotels in Cuba in the late 1990s which led to the initiation of uh, very close uh, communications between Cuba and the United States around counterterrorism cooperation at uh, the tail end of the Clinton administration. Mm. Peter. Well, here we are uh, uh, at the last two years of the Obama administration. Many of you will remember during the primaries in 2008 when uh, it was neck and neck with Hillary Clinton for the Democratic uh, nomination, when Obama, if I'm not mistaken, went during a CNN community uh, meeting, uh, said he would uh, sit down and actually talk to Raul Castro. Um, he didn't have a problem with uh, kind of approaching in a more civil way uh, the enemies of the United States in an effort to uh, find common ground. Um, he, uh, in one of his earliest uh, speeches uh, as a candidate, he said that the that the uh, 50 years of, of policy towards Cuba had failed. Um, and just a few months ago in Miami, uh, he reiterated that it was, uh, you know, difficult to, to think that a policy that was developed in the early 60s in this modern day and age would still be applicable and useful uh, today. Um, but as uh, Bill and, and I have written in the uh, Nation magazine piece, uh, which, which you uh, have, and I want to make sure that you take, uh, that's just out today, um, uh, if he really believes that, he better act fast because time is running out. Um, Obama has taken steps to significantly change the tone of U.S.-Cuban relations. Um, uh, the rhetoric is down, the cooperative aspects of the secondary issues such as migration and counterterrorism, um, uh, military to military talks, um, uh, disaster. Uh, 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 collaborate, collaboration on potential disaster scenarios such as oil spills, um, uh, etc., are, are up. Um, but um, the overall framework of policy uh, continues as it's been for almost uh, 55 years. Plus, the Obama administration, much to the chagrin of uh, the Cubans, have continued uh, these uh, uh, kind of semi covert democracy promotion programs. Uh, in Cuba, uh, the one that got Alan Gross arrested uh, in late 2009, and he's been in a Cuban prison ever since. Um, Obama has not been able to bite the political bullet uh, and make a prisoner exchange uh, with the Cubans. The three remaining Cuban spies, you've heard of the, the Cuban Five, well, it's now the Cuban Three, um, who have been in jail here for over 15 years uh, for spying operations mostly on exile groups. Um, for Alan Gross, uh, the USAID subcontractor. This is part of a larger issue of, of um, U.S.-Cuban relations, the embargo, uh, the overall framework in which you see how far we are from normal, a normal uh, relationship. Um, and there's no way to get Alan Gross out, there's no way to move forward unless Obama actually is ready to step up uh, with a degree of political courage and secure his legacy by actually changing policy towards Cuba. One of the issues that is the key issue that's raised in this article is that he actually has a window of opportunity to do that. These next four or five months are critical in U.S.-Cuban relations. Why? Because in April of 2015, for the first time 
there we may see a U.S. president sit at a uh, regional summit conference across the conference room table from the president of Cuba. Panama is hosting the Summit of the Americas, the seventh Summit of the Americas conference. In the first six, Cuba has been excluded uh, by the United States for this upcoming one, the Latin American countries basically banded together and said, look, we're not coming. We're going to boycott this unless Cuba comes as well. Uh, and uh, Panama, which is hosting this summit, actually sent their foreign minister to Havana two weeks ago, um, and she issued a face-to-face -face personal invitation to Raul Castro to attend. Obama now has basically two decisions to make, and Bill Leo Grand is really very articulate about uh, uh, enunciating these, um, uh, and he has done so in this, in this uh, article. Um, one is whether he actually goes uh, or capitulates to right-wing pressure not to go and therefore embarrasses the United States and isolates the United States from the entire summit, so we'd be the only country that didn't go. Uh, uh, and two is whether he goes and actually makes uh, an effort to talk civilly to Raul Castro or he carries an agenda to uh, basically uh, snub him and, 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 and uh, criticize him uh, publicly. We would hope that this book contains the lessons uh, and they are elaborated in the last chapter of the book and in the article that Obama needs to, to, to know about the whole history of talking to Cuba that will help him go to Panama in April and talk to Raul Castro. I have to monitor whether this gets on its reading list. We'll have spies in the White House. Can you do that? Back. I can help. I can okay. help. Uh, but let me open up to others to, to pose questions and comments. Lawrence? Yeah, uh, what is your assessment of how serious Cuba has been over the years in trying to have a breakthrough there, since there are uh, many observers who suggest that the Castro brothers have needed the embargo to explain away problems, domestic problems in Cuba? Yeah, I, I think you know, at different times in this history, uh, the Cubans have been more and or less interested than the United States in improving relations. So. Uh, during the Kissinger period and, and the Carter administration, I think the United States was honestly interested in, in a normalization process. We were facing a lot of pressure from Latin America at that time, as well as now, uh, to improve our relations with Cuba. Uh, but for Cuba, its solidarity with its allies in Africa was more important. It was higher on their foreign policy agenda. And so they were willing to sacrifice the normalization process in order to pursue their involvements in Angola and in Ethiopia. I think since the end of the Cold War, however, uh, the Cubans have been more interested in normalizing relations than we have. Uh, with the end of the Cold War, Cuba ceased to be a very serious problem for the United States. So we had, frankly, less security interest in really trying to solve this, uh, this or, or untie this Gordian knot of our relationship. Whereas for the Cubans, no longer with the patronage of the Soviet Union, n normalizing relations, reducing the security threat from the United States, and opening up economic activity with the United States has been, I think, a high priority. No question that Fidel Castro made his political career confronting the United States. And, and we even quote him uh, in the book saying, that if normal relations ever came about, it, he would lose a little of his, his prestige. Uh, he, he acknowledged that. Um, he was very good at wrapping himself in the Cuban flag um, and appealing to Cuban nationalism. Raul Castro is a different character. And if you look at his speeches, his domestic speeches, if you look at the, uh, the message that he's giving to the Cuban people, um, it's all about trying to solve their domestic economic problems which he does not blame on the U.S. embargo or on the United States. He blames it on problems in their own economic model that need to be solved. So uh, Raul hasn't tried to, to legitimize his United States in the same way that Fidel. So I think <clears throat> that means that right now is a particularly opportune moment for the two countries to come together because I believe now we have presidents in both countries that recognize that the current state of affairs doesn't make sense for the national interest of either country, and both are willing to move ahead. Just as a quick follow, were you surprised <coughs> by William, uh, by Hillary Clinton's revelations that she was opposed to the embargo through her tenure as Secretary of State, saying what Lawrence just did, that the 
embargo kept the Castros in power? I was, I was a little bit surprised uh, to hear that she was opposed to the embargo uh, while she was Secretary of State because we certainly didn't hear that at all publicly. Um, I think um, it, it, it takes some political courage on her part to say it now on the assumption that she is going to run for president. Uh, I think it, it reflects, however, the way in which the politics of Florida have changed. Um, it used to be that having a hard line on Cuba was uh, a strategic necessity for Democratic political candidates if they hoped to carry Florida. Um, but Barack Obama has, has proved that that strategy is an anachronism. He well, got 35 percent of the Cuban American vote in 2008 and somewhere between 49 and 51 percent of the Cuban American vote in 2012. And that's because the demographic composition of that community has changed so much in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, the community now is, is younger, um, it's more recent arrivals, it has a higher com uh, component of people who were born in the United States and the younger people, the more recent arrivals and people born in the United States all have much more moderate attitudes toward U.S. relations with Cuba uh, than the exiles who came in the 1960s and the 1970s and who lost everything in the revolution. So as the politics there change, uh, I think it makes some sense for Hillary to now take a new position. Alison Silver. Um, I wanted to ask you to extrapolate a bit. Now that you've seen all the back ch the channels we've had with Cuba, would it be possible to think about having back channels using the same um, um, you know, tactics with a country like Iran? Is there a way of applying what we've learned? So would the unsuccessful back channel tactics right. with Cuba have any <laughs> lessons and learn in, from it the, and yeah, be able to run. think about something with a country like or Iran where we're also publicly not speaking to Right. Them. Well, I think actually we have had some of those back channel discussions right. with Iran uh, to try to get the current more public process <laughs> started in the first place. Um, I think presidents uh, use these kind of back channels all the time. Um, I, I don't think this is confined to Cuba, although I do think that we've probably seen more of it in the case of Cuba than we have with a lot of countries because of the political sensitivity of the Cuba issue domestically in the United States, which has driven presidents away from uh, the formal diplomatic channels and, and more towards the private envoy kind of channels. But the idea of having secret talks that sort of don't get out in the public as a way to uh, smooth the ground, if you will, for then a more, pro a more public kind of initiative, um, that's very common. Of course, that's how Kissinger dealt with China. Um, uh, you know, there was a lot of back and forth before, before Nixon actually went. Tom Pickering is Mr. Back Channel on Iran. Uh, Steve Fessinger. Uh, one of the things that sort of is left out of this conversation, what, the position of the Republican Party towards Cuba, you have a lot of uh, Republicans from farming states that want to normalize relationships with Cuba because they want to sell their products there. Has that had any role in, in some of these conversations that are ongoing privately with Cuba? So um, I, I think the, the, the commercial side of it has not really been a big issue in most of the private diplomatic exchanges that we examined. It's been more the political and security issues, but ob obviously with the whole issue of the embargo on the Cuban side being sort of the core issue that they want to get at. The, um, the agricultural uh, interests sort of carried the day in 2000 when they were able to lift the embargo on the sale of food and medicine to Cuba. And so we now sell uh, several hundred million dollars worth of food to Cuba every year. And ironically, what that did was it sort of it took the steam out of uh, Midwest Republicans who had been supporting an opening to Cuba because they got they the got thing the that deal. was most important to them, which was the ability to sell corn and wheat and, and so on. Can I editorialize for a minute? Lawrence worked in, in the Congress. I worked in the Senate in the 1990s, and I thought one of my greatest achievements ever was getting uh, uh, under Jesse Helms' tenure, a, a kind of Cuba opening that dealt with remittances and helping in natural disasters. It was just the three simple things that Senator Bingaman put forward. And we got Jesse Helms' committee to accept 
the uh, resolution in so it could be considered in committee and we had this happen in the House as well. So I thought we were going to have one of the biggest openings under Republican tenure and it was Bob Torricelli who came down at midnight and said, I'm not going to let Jeff Bingham and change U.S. Cuba relations in the middle of the night. And, and I, you know, it was, it was, but we had more Republicans line up and we probably, if Torricelli had not done that, would have had at least a foundation on which Republicans across the board. Kit Bond was very much into this at the time, was one of the senators. So there were a lot of Republicans who had a much forward, m m in the 1990s, a much more forward looking thing. Sorry to editorialize. No, but no, it was, a, exactly it was fascinating. Right. I, I remember Torricelli's staff coming up to me and apologizing for what their <laughs> boss had done. No, so, uh, <laughs> yes, right here. Um, do I understand correctly that some of these telegrams were just declassified like 10 days ago? Uh, and if yes, uh, when did you get access to them? <laughs> Uh, I mean, according, maybe I don't read that correctly, but it says the No, you're, you're, looking at, you're looking at a stamp of when I think it was copied um, oh, uh, at, at the library, although I'm not exactly sure what, what document you're, you're, you're specifically well, looking at. By Tarko, it says N-A-R-A date. Yes, yes. What does N-A-R-A stand for? NARA stands for NARA, the National uh, uh, Archives uh, Records Administration. So that is the day that it was, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that particular document was uh, printed out and, and, and sent to me. The documents that Bill Leo Grand described about J. Paul Austin, his 1980 trip, uh, the debriefing with Peter Tarnoff, and then Tarnoff's trip, those are all documents that have only been declassified in the last month or so. So they're brand new. We didn't actually have uh, full access to that story uh, for, the, for the book. And the Kissinger and file documents? The Kissinger contingency plan documents uh, we obtained um, uh, several years ago uh, during the course of writing uh, and the classified book. them yourselves until? We uh, <laughs> embargoed them. We embargoed them uh, since I'm the machine of declassification, right? Uh, we held out, let's put it as we just held, kept them under wraps um, uh, because we uh, knew that they were an important part of the story that hadn't been told about Kissinger and Castro. Uh, and of course, we wanted our book to be uh, newsworthy, to have something to share with you. But what we're here sharing with you are, are those documents. Um, uh, the the uh, J. Paul Austin documents, which are you know a, a colorful, a, a bit sad story, but an important story about the use of a of a, a secret emissary between the United States uh, and Cuba. Um, we interviewed Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, and he said to us, you know, uh, Austin just we didn't know what the guy was talking about when he came back. Um, uh, he clearly had a problem. Um, this is a uh, a cautionary tale basically he said you know uh, about using uh, private sector uh, intermediaries as opposed to official channels. We see this story and we share it with you as another indication, uh, another reason why the United States should have those official channels of communication. Full ambassador, a full embassy, normal communications uh, about uh, the mutual interests and mutual problems that the two countries confront. As long as Cuba uh, remains a political hot potato and a sensitive political subject, um, presidents are going to be using back channels uh, to keep their communications out of the public domain with all sorts of, of uh, consequences uh, and problems. But what I think the cumulative uh, history shows us, as, as it is in the book, and this is why I think we did the book and why the book is important, um, is that uh, civil relations are not only possible, but uh, preferable, uh, particularly in this day and age. So, I mean, in your view right now, in this, in this present moment, what is Obama's main political obstacle? I mean, we have the changing demographics in Florida, we have public opinion overwhelmingly in favor, uh, you know, there's even the, the, a sector of the GOP is <coughs> on board, uh, elite uh, ex-functionaries and I have put out public statements <laughs> saying, you know, we're ready for this. But it seems like, has it really come down to three legislators that he's terrified of? Or what, uh, what is the first point? I actually think it comes down really to one legislator. I, I think... Um, uh, you know that Senator Menendez um, has has had a critical role 
in the administration's uh, policy towards Cuba. It goes back to the very early months of the Obama administration when uh, Senator Menendez was willing to hold up an omnibus appropriation bill um, until he got a promise from the administration that uh, they would consult with him before changing Cuba policy. And I think the administration has um, held to that. I think that they do consult with him regularly and he's been so vociferously opposed to a change in the policy that uh, uh, you know I think the administration hasn't been willing to really go against him. The other problem of course is the problem of Alan Gross. Um, and the arrest of Alan, at the time of the arrest of Alan Gross, the administration said we're not moving forward until he's released. And so they've painted themselves into a corner to a certain extent. Um, now they began to back away a little bit from that um, in the second administration after the 2012 election when they resumed dialogue with Cuba or on uh, a variety of secondary issues like <coughs> narcotics cooperation, Coast Guard cooperation, oil spill mitigation, and so on. And they've actually made a lot of progress in those secondary issues. But I think they still um, haven't come to the point of being willing to take the political risk of taking an initiative that might get Alan Gross out of jail and remove that obstacle from the path toward uh, a deeper discussion of some of the core issues between the two countries. I was wondering if you could talk about um, when you've noticed like, egregious discrepancies between <coughs> what's been spoken about privately and what's been spoken about publicly. <laughs> um, well, pr I, I would say uh, I would say one of the biggest discrepancies was probably at the tail end of the Kennedy administration, when uh, there were secret initiatives by the administration to open a dialogue with Cuba, and a hope that in the aftermath of the missile crisis, the Cubans were so angry at the Soviets we might be able to entice them back into the orbit of the United States. And so there was an initiative through uh, being handled at the United Nations with the Cuban. Uh, uh, Cuban representative at the United Nations to try to open uh, a dialogue toward normalization. At the same time, if you read some of President Kennedy's speeches about Cuba, it is as hardline Cold War speeches as as uh, as ever. And so there was this was it. His diplomatic initiative was extremely closely held. Just the president and a handful of people knew about it, and so you didn't see any reflection of it. In, in the in the public rhetoric or the public dialogue, in a lot of the other cases, um, there is a softening of the rhetoric at the time that some of these negotiations are going on. Uh, even though the negotiations are going on in secretly, you see, as as uh, as one of uh, the Clinton administration officials said to us when we interviewed him, uh, that we dialed back the rhetoric. And the Cubans appreciated that, and it was it was uh, it made it possible to sort of open the door toward toward uh, dialogues, which then were going on secretly, but at least the public animosity between the two countries seemed the temperature seemed to be going down. One of the weirdest encounters I had in, in U.S. Cuba relations was one night Ambassador Bolianos, who was the director of the Cuban interest section in Washington, called me about midnight and said, "Can you help me get a hold of Jeff Goldberg?" And and I said, "Wow, that's an odd." odd connection and <laughs> and uh, of course Jeff Goldberg is the Atlantic so I, I helped connect them. Next thing I knew Jeff Goldberg was on a plane down to Havana to meet and do this big interview with Castro because Castro didn't like Ahmadinejad's comments about Israel and Cuba wanted to or Castro wanted to sort of send the signals that that kind of anti-semitism had no place in a civilized world etc cetera, etc cetera. and I was wondering whether or not Castro was trying to signal something broader and whether there was any sort of uh, connection that you guys saw in the government to government, you know, back channel side of this, whether the Goldberg uh, article was relevant. Had, did you follow that at all? Yes. he. Uh, I believe that, that Jeff had written this uh, major piece on, uh, on Israel's uh, great temptation to attack Iran mm. uh, and that um, Fidel Castro uh, was worried about uh, that and wanted to, uh, uh, he was impressed by the article but he was also concerned uh, about its implications and wanted to talk uh, further uh, about it. Um, we, we had the chance to have lunch with Fidel Castro uh, pretty much at the beginning of our, of our, of our work on this book. Uh, it was all the way back in 2005. 
Uh, Did and he declassify any of his documents for you? <laughs> the, the funny thing is, is that he made a big point of doing that uh, as we were leaving. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. We're standing at the door of the Palacio de Convenciones waiting for the car to come, and he says, Corn Blue, I'm declassifying the cover memo of the Gabriel Garcia Marquez report on his trip to bring a message to President Clinton in 98. And, uh, and he said, you know, and I wanted to give it to you because I know you want these uh, declassified documents. But then I thought to myself, I have to call Gabo. I have to call Garcia Marquez and ask him if he per give me permission for this. So, uh, llame, anybody speak Spanish here? Llame a, a la esposa Mercedes. Y Mercedes, estoy fiel, soy fiel. You know, está Gabo ahí. Tengo que preguntar si puedo declasificar este documento para Cornblow. I have to, he calls his wife and he says, you know, I have to talk to Gabo about whether uh, he approves me declassifying this document. Of course, it was a cover memo. It wasn't, uh, it was, you know, it was basically, uh, I hereby turn in this report about my trip to, uh, to the United States to deliver a secret message to uh, President Clinton. Um, uh, but he was uh, very animated and I think somewhat proud of the fact that he had Declassified yeah, something. Yeah. Declassified yeah. something. And it, and it was the only declassified document that Cubans gave us, as a matter of fact. Um, but I will say that um, Cuban diplomats who engaged in these negotiations with the United States were very generous with their time, and we were able to interview almost all the principal Cuban negotiators as well as almost all of the principal U.S. negotiators, and to hear their different visions of what went on at the bargaining table when they were across from one another was really absolutely fascinating. Let me just say that we interviewed three of the four people that were in room 727 on July 9th, 1975. Uh, about that uh, that meeting. Did you ever meet the Eagle Burger? We or? knew Eagle Burger, but we didn't get a chance to talk to him uh, about this. He also succumbed to um, Alzheimer's disease um, uh, right at the time when we were getting ready to interview him. He actually didn't remember the meeting. Oh. Um, and uh, But we did interview at length William uh, Rogers, who was sitting at the table upstairs, and we met uh, at great length with the two Cubans. Now, you and Bill Rogers, just, and I'll take any other questions that won't wrap this up, but you and Bill Rogers had this cooperative relationship and this antagonistic relationship. I mean, I remember Bill very well, and, and he was kind of constantly taking you on with your account for things. What were your biggest differences with Bill Rogers? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a two-country story. We had, our, we had our differences over Chile, and you remember this because right, I right, think right. you were there right. at the New America Foundation when the book was rolled out, right. and, and the rollout for my book on Pinochet was a discussion with Bill Rogers about Kissinger and Pinochet. Uh, and uh, so we had our great differences uh, on that issue. Uh, and then we had our great uh, common interests uh, and positive interests on the Cuba story. He uh, is one of, I'd say, the you know the heroes in a sense. Uh, I liked him very much. Um, uh, he's passed away a number of years ago, but luckily we were able to interview him at length for this book. But um, uh, by that time, he was so mad at me about Chile that Bill had to go interview him. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, um, no, I worked with him very closely to get his secret file that he kept on the whole <coughs> Kissinger initiative declassified, and that's how the reason that we know about it is because he was cooperative uh, uh, on on that. But um, I, I, I liked him very much. Uh, we, we worked on uh, this uh, this issue. He was one of the, the heroes because he kept pushing Kissinger. You know, this is the opportunity we can normalize relations. And when Cubans went into Angola. He didn't understand why they would pass up this opportunity, and he went to have this one final meeting with Nestor Garcia, and he said to him, according to Garcia, he said, Nestor, I'm sorry for the undiplomatic language, but you fucked it up. You know, you're in Angola, Nestor, and we can't normalize relations with you while you're in Angola. He then sat down with one of the intermediaries, Kirby Jones, and this is described at the end of the Kissinger chapter, and basically said, what am I missing in this picture? Why didn't the Cubans take us up on? We were ready to do this, uh, and, and, and Cuba wasn't, and we don't understand why. And, and this is part of the issue for U.S. officials along the way. Cuba's always had uh, the sanctity of the independence of its own foreign policy, the sanctity of the independence of its own uh, domestic uh, socialist system, basically off the table for negotiations. Fidel was fond of saying, I don't tell the United States what to do around the world, and they shouldn't tell me 
what to do around the world. But not only is Bill, I think, well represented for his role on trying to push the Cuba envelope forward in a big way, but all the other Bill Rogers in this history are also in the book. And I, I want to say publicly um, that from the 60s all the way to, to into the end of the, the Clinton administration, um, there are some really interesting, important people inside of government, outside of government, who are worth uh, reading about, who have, who have consistently pushed the, the, the national security bureaucracy forward on the issue of Cuba. Quick question. Could you say something about your discussion with Sanchez Peroni? Because I've read some things by him that suggest he thinks that relations will never be normalized between the United States and Cuba. I, I've had that conversation with, with Sanchez Peroni myself. Um, and he is extremely skeptical that the United States will ever come around to being able to accept the Cuban Revolution. And yet, um, when he was a diplomat, he worked very hard to make relations better, um, despite his skepticism. Uh, so when he was in these negotiations, although he drove a hard bargain uh, in, in the meeting here at the Pierre and in subsequent meetings uh, representing the Cuban position, uh, nevertheless, he, he was in favor of, of moving the process forward. When he served for many years as uh, head of the Cuban interest section in Washington, D.C., he worked very closely with a number of U.S. diplomats, particularly during the Carter years, um, trying to, to make relations better. So while I think he's always been skeptical about whether the United States could ever accept the revolution, he's been at least willing to keep trying to find out. Uh, since Bill Clinton signed the Helms Burton Act in 1996, he in effect signed away presidential relevance to these issues. It is now a legislative matter. And so uh, it seems we, we may have, in the 21st century anyway, been focusing too much on the presidency's interest in this matter and what their little chats might or might not be about. But, uh, and, and when you, once, it's, now that it's in the legislative arena, it actually seems more impossible than ever. Uh, and that legislative arena is not maturing on this subject with uh, Ted Cruz and, and the House of Representatives and its current uh, composition. Yeah. It is true that to lift the embargo against Cuba requires a repeal or modification of Helms-Burton, and that's a legislative action. But the President has um, quite vast executive authority to license various kinds of commerce. Uh, and presidents from George W. from Clinton to George W. Bush to Obama have made use of that <coughs> licensing authority um, to open up cracks in the embargo, if you will. Um, I mean, despite the fact that we have this embargo, half a million uh, U.S. residents will travel to Cuba this year. Um, we will sell 300 some odd million dollars worth of food to Cuba. Uh, Cuban Americans will send upwards of two and a half billion dollars in remittances and another two billion dollars in gift packages to relatives in Cuba. So there is a degree of, of commerce and knitting together of, of the two societies today, despite Helms Burton. And if the president was of a mind, he has a lot of options of things that he could do to move that process forward before he would have to actually go to Congress and seek a repeal of the embargo. Just to close it out, when we were with Henry Mankiewicz, you know, he was telling a story of being in Havana early on in the early days and Fidel Castro coming to his hotel door, knocking on the door, and uh, Henry was in his boxer shorts and shaving. Uh, when he opened the door, there's Fidel Castro, and, he, and Fidel came in and sat in and began talking to him as, <laughs> as he was undressed, and well, it was a great story. And there are other stories like that. There were stories of hearing of, of, of various Cuban delegation members, maybe the Pierre Hotel and all the bath towels disappearing and things like that. Did any of that <laughs> stuff make it into the book? All of it. Oh, yeah. All of it is in there. The story of the bath towels, there's one of the things that comes out uh, and that we really talk about in the book. Was it Pierre Hotel bath towels? No, okay, it wasn't. Hotels. No, it was the bath towels in at, Mexico. In Mexico. Oh, Cuernavaca. At, at, in, in, uh, they were meeting in a hotel in, in Cuernavaca. Um, here at the Pierre, I think, was when they ordered in room service, wasn't it? And, and the Cubans got the room service menu and just ordered a five-course meal. And uh, 
the, Why not? the State Department folks were a little worried about getting their accountants to approve that when they got back and their expense <laughs> accounts. Um, but one of the things that comes across as, as these diplomats met with one another, because a lot of them were the same people meeting over and over and over over the course of the years, is the sort of common human connections that they made. So some of them really became friends and and dealt with one another at a level of humanity which is really impressive. Um, so for example, Peter Tarnoff and Ricardo Alarcón became very close uh, colleagues and uh, would get together whenever they were in the same city just to sort of catch up with one another and, and on their families. Um, and, they, and that proved to be a really critical channel of communication, although ultimately unsuccessful, <coughs> during the 1996 prior to the Brothers to the Rescue shootdown, uh, when, when Alarcon simply picked up the telephone and called Peter Tarnoff and said, you know, we're, we're at the end of our uh, patience with this. This has got to stop or something's going to happen. Um, so we tell a lot of those kind of very human stories in in the book, and I think it's uh, it's one of the things that gives one of the things that gives us hope that in fact this relationship can be repaired because when you put Cuban and Americans together, even though they represent their governments, they find a way to get together and communicate and even become friends. During um, uh, the negotiations uh, uh, in the Carter era, there was a series of meetings and various parts of this here at the St. Regis Hotel, uh, down the street, um, in Cuernavaca, in Atlanta. At one of those meetings, the Cuban emissaries noticed that the, that the Americans were uh, toasting the translator, Stephanie von Regensburg, for her birthday. Um, and they decided they should do something nice. They wanted to go get her flowers. Uh, but it was late in the day, and all the flower stores were closed. Uh, they walked past a funeral home, <laughs> and creative and, uh, and diplomatic as they were, they somehow talked the funeral home director into letting them take a vase of flowers uh, from one of the showing areas. And they took it and they presented it to the American translator, Stephanie, um, with their best wishes for her birthday. And of course she noticed that there was a plaque on it that said, in memoriam. <laughs> and she still told us uh, in one of the you know, nicest interviews that we had. She still told us this was, as she said at the time, she said, I told them this was the sweetest birthday present I had ever gotten. I've always sort of thought there was a Grand Budapest Hotel dimension to U.S.-Cuba relations that were just so eccentric in many ways uh, and fascinating, but nonetheless important. Uh, and I remember, I don't know if you remember the old days of flip videos, but I used to go to strategic conferences with people like Brzezinski and Scowcroft, and I commissioned a book with them, and I would take my flip video and I would put it in front of it. What about this Cuba thing? And I remember Brett was very irritated with me one day. Uh, and he says, okay, I'll tell you, there, there is no strategic dimension to U.S.-Cuba relations anymore. It's entirely a domestic issue, meaning that that's what had happened. It was really along the lines of what Lawrence had said. Uh, and it's been interesting that when it was a truly a strategic question, that didn't get fixed. Now it's become more domestic, downgraded as an issue. Of course, it's hard to fix that as well. Um, so we're entertained by, by all the dimensions. But you here you have, uh, in Bill Leo Grand and Peter Cornblew, two of the, uh, really the two most informed people on every nook and cranny of, of U.S. government efforts to do something different with Cuba and vice versa. So thanks very much, and thank you all very much for coming.